Chapter 1 A frozen waffle has ruined my life. Teddy's frozen waffle, if you really want to know. This whole disaster is totally his fault. Thanks a lot, pal. Teddy's one of my two best friends. Francis is the other. Teddy's specialty is, he does the best armpit fart in the whole sixth grade. <laughs> That's so gross. But I'm pretty ticked off at Teddy right now. He's the reason I'm standing here in front of half the school getting my butt handed to me by Principal Nichols. It started yesterday in social studies. That's when Mrs. Godfrey, a.k.a. Jabba the Gut, assigned a research paper. Guess who has to write about the War of 1812? Worst topic ever. Try applying yourself for a change, Nate. Remember, this is the last project before report cards come out. Inspired by those heartwarming words, I flipped through the textbook. And you know what it said about the War of 1812? Absolutely nothing. It was probably written in 1811. Anyway, that's when Teddy came to the rescue. Or so I thought. Dramatic flashback! Yesterday. You must pass in a detailed outline first thing tomorrow. Oop! Tomorrow? I've got an idea. Come over to my house after school. My dad's a history buff. He's got tons of books about all kinds of wars. Really? Awesome! Sounded like a plan. After school, we all walked over to Teddy's. Me, Francis, Dee Dee, and Chad. And it went great. Mr. Ortiz's books were so full of boring facts and useless information, the kind of stuff teachers love, that in no time at all, I pulled together a pretty rockin' outline. Wait till old Death Breath sees this. Wow, it looks totally pro. So far, so good, right? Well, not quite. Because later, like, I'm already in my jammies later, I was going through my backpack, and the outline wasn't there. So I called Teddy. Teddy, did I leave my... Yep, it's right here on my kitchen table. I'll bring it to school tomorrow. Don't worry about it. So? I didn't worry about it. I went to bed thinking my outline was safe in Teddy's kitchen. Little did I know what would happen the next morning. Welcome to Teddy's Brainless Breakfast. Teddy's Kitchen, 7 a.m. Rats, we're out of sugar puffs. Suddenly, Claude the Stupid Ideas Fairy appears. Greetings, friend. Who are you? I'm Claude the Stupid Ideas Fairy. Wow. Say, why not have a frozen waffle for breakfast? Yeah, I think I will. Now, put this open bottle of maple syrup here, right next to Nate's outline. Brilliant. Moments later. Whoops, clunk, sploosh. I spilled maple syrup all over the outline. <laughs> Imagine that. Here's a thought. Try washing it off in the sink. Okay. Ah! The water's making the ink run. Hmm. Didn't see that coming. Now the paper's disintegrating. Nate's outline is ruined. Well, I see my work here is done. So long, Teddy. Until next time. And there will be a next time. <sighs> End. Okay, it probably didn't go exactly like that. Whatever, the point was, when I got to school this morning, I found out that Teddy had turned my outline into a soggy, syrupy pile of confetti. You did what? Sure, I could tell Mrs. Godfrey the whole story. She loves listening to excuses. She's so understanding.
So, your house burned down? Deal with it. You have a note from your doctor? How do I know you didn't write it yourself? Since when does a fractured skull mean you can't do homework? Couldn't you have finished the worksheet after your goldfish's funeral? Class was starting in three minutes, and I had no outline. Talk about a stress fest. I was twitching like a bag of microwave popcorn. So, I did what I always do when I get nervous. I bonked myself on the head with an empty plastic bottle. Yeah, maybe it's a little weird, but have you ever tried it? It feels good. It's relaxing, and it makes kind of a cool sound. Thunk, 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 thunk. Nate! M Mrs. Godfrey? What on earth are you doing? What was I doing? Wondering how the Bride of Sasquatch could have snuck up behind me, that's what. I mean, she's big, she's loud, and she smells like onions. How does she sneak up on anybody? Drinking soda in the hallways is strictly forbidden. Huh? Oh, no, it's empty. Are you referring to the bottle? Or your head? Dispose of that, now! What could I say? I was busted. I waited until she'd gone back into her classroom. Then I spotted the recycling bin over by the computer lab. She wants me to dispose of it? Fine. Zing! We now interrupt this flashback with a fact about plastic bottles. They're bouncy. That's what makes them such good stress busters. But it means that if you throw one, the chances are better than average that it's gonna bounce off where you want it to go. Tong! Oh no. And end up someplace else. Clang! Like that. Bullseye. Are you out of your mind? Sorry, 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 sorry! There. Now you know why the principal is yelling at me till his tonsils burst. That's the end of the flashback. And the start of another fantastic day. Note the sarcasm. I don't want to sound all whiny and everything, but my life stinks lately. Nate's real-life lowlights. Actual events from the past week. Thursday. Did you even look at the study guide? Friday. Wow. Check out all those cavities. Saturday. Hmm. That's odd. I washed your uniform and it came out pink. Ah! Sunday. Has anybody ever told you you have stupid hair? Monday. Hi, girls. Anybody sitting here? <laughs> Tuesday. My book report is, look everyone, Nate's zipper is open. It's not just one thing. It's a whole bunch of stuff. And it all adds up to a hot, steaming pile of outlines, people. Hand them in. Oop. Um, Mrs. Godfrey? Yes? I, uh, don't have my outline. It's sort of a funny story. See, I was, <clears throat> I was over at Teddy's house, and Nate, stop. I don't want to hear it. Your funny stories are usually total fiction. Before I can answer, Teddy's beside me. But it's true. He was at my house, and he did an outline, but he left it on my kitchen table. And then this morning, instead of cereal... I decided to have a frozen waffle for breakfast, and when... <laughs> Hear that, lady? Teddy's backing me up. What do you say now? Perhaps you missed what I told your friend here. I don't want to hear it! If you're keeping score, that's Godfrey 1, Truth 0. I guess when you're a teacher, you don't sweat the small stuff. Like the facts! Hand in the outline by the end of the day, Nate, and you could still earn half credit. That sounds about right. Half credit for a half wit. Ugh. Here's another reason my life's a total bite fest lately. Gina's been even more obnoxious than usual. She loves to see me get in trouble. It's like Christmas for her. And right now, 
Every day's a holiday. Stuff a sock in it, needle nose. Gina smirks. That's not even original, she hisses. You used the same exact insult on me yesterday. I felt my cheeks start to burn. I did, didn't I? I'm reusing my own material. Wow, even my trash talking has gone stale. I can't do anything right. What a slump I'm in. Actually, slump might not be the word I'm looking for. Slumps usually happen in sports, like when the game just doesn't go your way no matter how hard you try. I've been in sports slumps before, and it's usually not that big a deal. Unless you have a psycho for a coach. Just relax! You're not relaxed enough! Irk. No. This is more than a slump. It's bad luck, that's what it is. Horrible luck. And I can't find a way out of it. The bell finally rings, and the gang joins me as we all file out of the classroom. Nate, um, sorry about the outline thing. He looks so serious, I can't help but crack a smile. It's impossible to stay mad at Teddy. It wasn't your fault, I tell him. You tried to take the blame. How are you supposed to know that Mrs. Godfrey would be in full rage mode? <laughs> Is she ever not in full rage mode? Francis asks. Good point, the rest of us say together. Hey, we've got a free period. Let's play add-on in the cafetorium. Yay! I can't, I groan. I've got to get that stupid outline done. I shuffle off toward the library. War of 1812, here I come. You keep your chin up, Nate, Dee Dee chirps as I trudge down the hallway. The day's just starting. It'll get better. It has to, I call back. How could it get any worse? Chapter 2 Nate! Just the kiddo I'm looking for. Mrs. Hickson greets me as I step into the library. I've just added some fantastic books to our graphic novels collection. They're right up your alley. I feel like telling her nothing's right up my alley these days. The way my luck's going, if I ended up in an alley, I'd probably get mugged. Uh, thanks. But I'll have to look at them later, I say. I've got to do some social studies first. Really? Her eyebrows practically pop off her face. Well, by all means, Nate, go right ahead. Nice. Does she have to look so shocked? I may not be Joe Scholar, but it isn't like I never come in here to do classwork. It only seems that way. Favorite library activities. One, table football. Kicking off. Flick, plonk. Ow! Two, thumb wrestling. One, two, three, four, I declare a thumb war. Three, beanbag Olympics. Cowabunga! Do you have any stuff I could look at about the War of 1812? I ask Mrs. Hickson, as if I really care. I just might, she answers. Let me see what I can find. She bustles off to who knows where. Maybe she's checking the boring books that nobody wants to read section. Anyway, looks like I'm here at the right time. When Hickey's in a good mood, like now, she's actually pretty nice. But like all teachers, she definitely has a dark side. I've seen her get pretty mad. Not Godfrey mad, but she's on the chart. Now she's back with a book the size of a stack of lunch trays. Here you go, she says. Whoomp! Oof! Thanks a lot. I can see the headlines now. Boy crushed by giant book. I don't know about you, but I try to avoid reading stuff that weighs more than I do. It has all the info I need, though. It only takes me 20 minutes to rewrite my outline. I'm getting ready to leave when... Oh, no. Ha ha ha. Look at this, everybody. It's Jenny and Artur, PS38's most popular couple. Aren't they sweet?
Aren't they adorable? Aren't they sickening? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Jenny's sickening. She's completely awesome. And I know a little something about awesomeness. No. What grosses me out is seeing the two of them together, slobbering all over each other like a pair of lovesick puppies. Okay, so they're a couple. Fine. Do they have to be so obnoxious about it? That's so funny, Pookie Bear. Did she just call him Pookie Bear? Pardon my gag reflex. Artur's no Pookie Bear. I can come up with way better names for him than that. And I will. What should she call him? Oh, Artur, you're such a... Insert name here. Yes, is true. Fart bucket. Piece of dry toast. Booger bunny. Ingrown toenail. Cuddle slug. Glass of warm prune juice. Sweat monkey. Zit wagon. Sad little clown. Barf o matic. Sand crab. Weasel boy. Nate wannabe. Pea brain. Wussy kins. Soon to be former boyfriend. You're probably hearing this list and thinking I'm hating on Artur, but believe it or not, I actually kind of like the guy. He just bugs me sometimes, that's all. And he's Jenny's love puppet. Hi, Nate. Chad, I thought you were playing add-on in the cafetorium. We were, but then some seventh graders started throwing tacos at us, he says. Seventh graders are such a pain, I mutter. Chad nods. Tell me about it. My hair smells like guacamole now. Chad fact. He's small for his age, so his grandmother taught him this saying. First to ripen, first to rot. He pulls up a chair beside me. What are you doing? Who, me? Oh, uh, nothing. I was <clears throat> about to start a new Ultranate story, that's all. Woo! Can I be in it? Sure, why not, I say. It's always fun to invent new characters. Make me a supervillain. You? <laughs> What's so funny? He asks, looking a little hurt. <laughs> Chad, no offense, but I don't think you're the supervillain type. You're too nice. I guess you're right, he admits. Maybe I'm more of a loyal sidekick kind of guy. Now that's a good idea, I tell him. Ultranate could use a sidekick. I start drawing. The amazing adventures of Ultranate, super sixth grader, and introducing his dynamic new crime-fighting partner, Mega Chad. Chad beams. Mega Chad? I like that. How about giving me a mask? Okay, I say, making a few pencil strokes. Any other requests? Chad doesn't answer right away. And when I look up from the table, I can see that he's looking at Maya and blushing. Can you put her in it? Who, Maya? I say surprised. Chad nods shyly, his cheeks now fire engine red. Maybe I could rescue her or save her life or something. Then quickly he adds, In your comics, I mean. Wow. This is news. I had no idea Chad had a thing for Maya. All right, trusty sidekick, I tell him, leaning over my notebook again. I'll see what I can do. One boring day in the library. I still don't understand the War of 1812. Hmm. If only we could go back in time to study it firsthand. Hey, we can. What do you mean? This is a job for Ultranate! Rip! And his trusty sidekick, Mega Chad! Rip! With our ultra speed, we'll break the time barrier and travel backwards through history. Next up, 1812. Zow! Microseconds later. We're here. I don't see any war going on. That's odd. According to my ultra compass, we should be standing in the middle of the Battle of New Orleans. Help! Help me, hunk-masked hero! Maya! How did she get here? 
She was in the library with us. She must have been swept up in the suction of our turbo velocity. Why were you up in that tree? I was hiding from that. Roar! I'll handle this, Maya. Pow! Nab! Zing a 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 fling! Meow! You were amazing. Hold it. Something's wrong. That was a saber toothed swamp cat, a species that's been extinct for over 3,000 years. But how is that possible? I mean, if we're in 1812. Oh, we're in 1812, all right. 1812 B.C. <gasps> That's why we couldn't find the Battle of New Orleans. The city doesn't exist yet. So I guess finding a pizza place is out of the question. We've got to get back to our own era. Let's hope we get it right this time. Zow. Shortly. We're back in the library. We made it. According to my calculations, we've been gone for one week. That means we missed a week of social studies. And your library books are all a week overdue. Wouldn't that be cool, Chad says when he's done reading. Having superpowers like that? Imagine being able to fly. We might not be able to fly, but we can do the next best thing, I tell him. Follow me. We angle over to the book nook, where a bunch of giant beanbag chairs sit empty in the corner. I do a quick 360 to make sure there's no sign of Hickey. Give me a hand, Chad, I whisper. Pile these up. Chad looks baffled. What are we doing? Making a crash pad, I tell him. Even Ultranade and Mega Chad need a soft place to land. Huh? You're gonna jump? He asks, his eyes widening. Superheroes don't jump, Chad, I remind him as I scramble up onto a table. We fly. <gasps> You're not getting me up there. Oh, come on, it's fun, and the beanbags are nice and soft. He looks around anxiously. But what if Mrs. Hickson sees us? I bend my knees, ready to launch myself into the pile. Chad, relax. Kids do this all the time and never get busted. Hickey's not going to suspect a thing. I guarantee it. Chapter 3 Pow! Uh-oh. Can I take that back? You blew a hole in it! Chad squeaks. Yeah, a humongous hole. The seam of one of the bean bags is split wide open and... Tiny styrofoam pellets are pouring out onto the floor. This is a disaster. It's leaking, Chad says. Quick, Chad, I hiss, trying to shovel the pellets back through the hole. We've got to clean this up before Hickey finds out. Oh, hi there, Mrs. Hickson. She gives me the V-S-H-E, the very scary, hairy eyeball. Then comes the audio. Loud noises are not welcome in the library, Nate, she growls. Especially the sound of a beanbag chair exploding. I guess I could point out that it didn't explode technically, and that if she wants to keep it quiet in here, maybe she should stop shrieking at me. But now's probably not the time. After airing out her dentures for a couple of minutes, Hickey finally stops to breathe. She looks at the styrofoam scattered all over the floor, then does one of those slow-mo librarian head shakes. Beanbag chairs don't grow on trees, boys. They don't? Wow. Thanks for the red-hot news flash. I'll add it to my list of amazing observations only adults can make. I never thought of that. Three dishes aren't gonna wash themselves, mister. This is gym class, not a pleasure cruise. I'm not getting any younger, you know. From out of nowhere, she pulls a small pink pad. Great. Another detention slip for my collection. You'll notice, Nate, that I'm signing this Mrs. Hickson, she tells me. Not Hickey. 
and Chad. I'm disappointed in you, too. Chad looks terrified. I don't think he's ever been to detention. In fact, he's almost a member of PS38's Least Likely to Get Detention Club. Five, Brad Macklin. Because he's just too much of a wuss wagon to ever get in trouble. <laughs> Whimper. Four, Karen McFadden. She's in the Peer Counseling Society, so she knows all about avoiding conflict. Let's communicate. Three, Artur Pashkov. It's impossible to get detention when you're perfect in every way. Hello, everybody's. Two, Noelle Nichols. She's the principal's niece, so even if she does something wrong, she's Teflon. Can't touch this. One, Gina Hemphill Toms. Yes, she did get detention once. Thank you, Ben Franklin. But that will never happen again. Never, 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 never. Hickey, I mean, Mrs. Hickson, points a finger at the leaky bean bag. That needs to be fixed, she announces. Take it to Miss Brindle. Chad instantly perks up. Miss Brindle, yes, he says under his breath. I'll explain later why Chad is a major Miss Brindle groupie. Right now, though, we have to deal with these stupid pellets, which turn out to have a major static cling problem. They're sticking to my hands and my clothes. Not to mention our hair, our faces. The little buggers stick to everything. In a couple of minutes, we both look like we've been swimming in an ocean of packing peanuts. Hi, Chad. <laughs> you look adorable. Did you hear that? Chad whispers excitedly. She said I'm adorable. Maybe Maya was just being nice. Or maybe she really does think Chad's adorable. Either way, I'm happy for him. I feel sort of guilty that he got detention when all he did was, Nate, you look like a complete idiot. Wait a minute, I say to Chad after Jenny and Artur walk off. How come I'm an idiot and you're adorable? He shrugs happily. Just lucky, I guess. Lucky? I don't even know what that word means anymore. So far today, I've been hung out to dry by Godfrey, Nichols, and Hickson. I'm three for three. Will Miss Brindle make it four? While Chad and I lug the beanbag chair to her classroom, I can tell you about Miss Brindle. Miss Brindle fact. Her classroom always smells like cinnamon. <sighs> she teaches life skills which isn't anything like a real class. It's more of a cross between a TV cooking show and a visit to your grandmother. There's no textbook and no homework. It's just Ms. Brindle teaching us random stuff. Some of it's lame. And that's how sales tax is calculated. Fascinating! Wait a minute. This is math. And some of it's awesome. Our chocolate chip coffee cake is done. Time for a taste test. Yay! Anyway, here's the one thing you need to know about Miss Brindle. She's the nicest teacher in the whole school. So if she ends up yelling at me, then I'll know I'm totally jinxed. Knock, knock. Come in, boys, and taste this snack I just made. That's why Chad's such a huge Miss Brindle fan. He's got a serious sweet tooth, and he knows that whenever he walks into a room... She's going to offer him cookies or brownies or stuffed cabbage rolls. Urk! Chad's face falls flatter than a mashed cat. C cabbage? He stammers. You don't have, um, anything else? I'm afraid not. Sorry, Chad, Ms. Brindle says with a smile. It's part of the school's new fitness zone program. Lunch, lunch. What's fitness zone? Principal Nichols will explain it at the assembly tomorrow, she continues. For my class, it means that from now on, we'll be focusing on making healthy food choices. Oh, Chad says, looking like he knows that healthy food choices is actually code for stuff you wouldn't even feed your pet gerbil.
Then Ms. Brindle nods toward the rip in the beanbag chair. Oh, my goodness, she says. What happened here? I, uh, sort of accidentally busted it. By diving off a table, Chad adds. Uh, Earth to Chad. Ever hear the phrase, too much information? But Ms. Brindle doesn't miss a beat. She just winks and says, Sounds like the two of you could use a sewing lesson. She shows us how to thread a needle, sew up the seam, and hide the stitches. In no time flat, our beanbags is good as new. Now that's teaching. Are you listening, Mrs. Godfrey? Thanks, Ms. B. You're welcome, boys. Good old Ms. Brindle, I say, after Chad and I leave her room and turn the corner. Yeah, but that cabbage was totally disgusting. Well, why'd you eat it then? I was trying to be polite, he says. But now my mouth tastes like I just gargled with coleslaw. I glance at the clock by the stairwell. We've still got ten minutes before English. If we hustle this thing back to the library, we'll have time to grab a quick snack. Ooh, yay! After Hickey gives the mended beanbag a nod of approval, we double back to the cafetorium to hit the vending machine. The snacks are on me, Chad. But when we get to the vending machine, we stand there for a minute like we're paralyzed. Then Chad finally says something. Sort of. What? Urk! Doof! Rice cakes? Soy nuts? Dried fruit? Fiber bars? This must be part of that new fitness zone thing, I say grimly. They're replacing all the snacks with bird food. I, uh, I don't think I'm all that hungry anymore, Chad mumbles. Yeah. I'm feeling a little sick myself. No more candy bars. No more gummy treats. And I'll try to say this without freaking out. No. More. Cheese doodles. Goodbye, bad, hello, worse. I don't know how much more of this I could take. I turn to see Dee Dee hurrying toward us. Nate! She's out of breath. There you are. She gasps. I've been looking all over for you. How come? To give you a message. Principal Nichols wants to see you in his office. Now. Chapter 4 What did I do this time? Principal Nichols already made me his punching bag once today. Is he going to ball me out again just for fun? Well, hello there, Nate. Hi, Mrs. Shapolsky, I say. She's the school secretary. If there's any upside to visiting the principal's office, she's it. Here's why. One, unlike her boss, she's actually nice to us. Good morning, kids. What's good about it? Two, she's the go-to person whenever there's an emergency. Mrs. Shapolsky, Francis is about to... Arf! Three, she keeps a giant jar of jelly beans on her desk. Yum! Lemon, cherry, orange. Try the pineapple. It's delish. Wait a minute. Speaking of jelly beans, where are they? Mrs. Shapolsky reads my mind. No more jelly beans, Nate, she says. We're becoming a candy-free office. Instead, how about some delicious wasabi peas? Uh, ah, Nate! Long time no see. Ha <laughs> ha! Come in. Whew! Saved by the big fella himself. No offense to Mrs. Shapolsky, but those peas look like a bowl full of rabbit turds. Nate, Principal Nichols says as he shuts the door behind us, you may have noticed a few changes around the school. Yeah, like the vending machine turning into a salad bar. But, hey, he's not shouting at me. Guess he's moved past that little plastic bottle incident. I was planning to make an announcement about those very changes at tomorrow's assembly, he continues. Then, I had an idea. <laughs> well, there's a first time for everything. 
why not liven things up with a little music? Music? Where is he going with this? And why is he telling me about it? You belong to a band, don't you, Nate? Capture the crustacean, or broil the lobster, or enslave the mollusk. Yeah, and FYI, I don't just belong to the greatest sixth grade rock band of all time. I started it. Nate's Real Life Comics presents Birth of a Band. It all began one day when Ellen was watching some cheesy boy band on TV. Ah, oh, aren't they dreamy? Oh, girl, you're so hot, and so am I. Dreamy? They stink. I suppose you think you could do any better? Yes. Yes, I could. I found Francis and Teddy. Guys, we're gonna start a band. Uh, we are? Yep, and we'll call ourselves Enslave the Mollusk. I like the name. It's so stupid, it's actually cool. We started rehearsing. Francis on guitar, Teddy on keyboards, and I was the lead singer. I thought we sounded awesome. But then one day while we practiced in my garage... What is going here? Oh, hey, Artur. Just a little band practice, that's all. Band? But I heard distinctive maiden call of Siberian mountain goat. <laughs> that was me, Artur. I was singing I Fought the Law. Oh, -ho! I know also this song. Breaking rocks in the hot sun. I fought the law and the law won. Wow. Artur, you're good. Want to join the band? Yes, absolute. I'm ready to sing my butts off. Great. Bad news. Artur became our lead singer and I took over on drums. Good news. It turned out I am an incredible drummer. I wonder why. Thunk, thunk, thunk. Wappity, wappity, wap, 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 wap. That's the story of Enslave the Mollusk. And we've been rocking ever since. In my garage. We've never performed in public. Principal Nichols is rambling on. Nate, this assembly is important. I want our message to be delivered in a memorable way. So I'm inviting Enslave the Mollusk to perform the announcement as a song. Whoa, really? I blurt out. My whole body is tingling. I mean, yeah, we could do that. Do you honestly think you can compose a song by tomorrow morning? He asks. No doubt about it, I say. I can whip up a song from nothing in no time. That's not bragging, by the way. It took me less than half an hour to write our latest song, It's a Pen's World, and I'm a number two pencil. You don't have to make up a song from nothing, Principal Nichols says. You just need to set these words to music. PS 38 is becoming a fitness zone. Studies show that most people aren't as physically fit as they could be. Let's improve the health and fitness of all our students and teachers by eating healthier lunches, snacking less between meals, exercising for at least 45 minutes every day. Hmm. Well, it's not exactly top 40 material, but Enslave the Mollusk can make it rock. I'll just get the guys together after school and... Nope! After school? Oh, no. Principal Nichols raises an eyebrow. Is there a problem? Um, sort of, I tell him. Mrs. Hickson gave me and Chad a detention today. I, uh, broke one of her beanbag chairs. But it was an accident, and we fixed it. It's as good as new. Hmm. Principal Nichols rubs his chin, then drops his voice to a whisper. Then I suppose you leave me no choice, Nate. To give you enough time to work on your song, I'll have to cancel your detention. I can hardly believe what I'm hearing. You will? And Chad's too? That depends, he says with a smile. Is Chad in the band? 
Chad fact. He plays the oboe, but the only song he knows is Three Blind Mice. Um, well, not quite, I admit. But he's sort of like our unofficial manager. All right. Both you and Chad are off the hook. Then he remembers who he is and wags a finger at me. Just this once. And Nate, I'm expecting an A-plus performance from Enslave the Mollusk tomorrow. Count on it. I peel out of there before he changes his mind. Wow, this is crazy. Wait till I tell the guys our band is gonna rock the assembly tomorrow. In front of the whole school. And wait till I tell Chad his detention was canceled. That never happens. But this is weird. When I do tell Chad during gym class, he doesn't seem surprised at all. I knew something like this would happen. Thanks to my lucky foot. Huh? Your lucky rabbit's foot, you mean? He shakes his head, then pulls something from his pocket. Nope, it's just a foot, see? It's part of some sort of action figure. Right after you left for the principal's office, I found it on the floor of the cafetorium. Uh, okay. I don't want to sound mean, but that's just some grubby piece of molded plastic. What makes you think it's lucky? I ask. For the second time today, Chad blushes like his butt's on fire. Well, as soon as I picked it up, Maya came by, and guess what? She actually talked to me! I thought she barely knew my name. Now she might be starting to actually like me. That proves my lucky foot works! No, it doesn't, Romeo. Look, I'm glad that Chad and Maya are on their way to Happy Town, but that little plastic foot has nothing to do with it. Real good luck charms are rare. You can't just make one by pulling the legs off a of G.I. Joe. But I've forgotten all about that by 3.15, when all four members of Enslave the Mollusk meet in my garage. And we are stoked. Nate, Artur asks, where is fitness on paper from Principal Nichols? Ah, he's stuck it in my backpack. It's over by the door. Okay, I am get it. Francis, Teddy, and I loosen up with one of our best songs. Why do they call it hot lunch when my meatloaf is so cold? It sounds okay, but it's way better with the vocal part. Hear that, Artur? We need you. Artur! Where'd he go? Maybe your guitar playing scared him off. Come on, let's find him. The three of us step outside and... Hey. What's this? He's halfway up the block. Artur, what are you doing? We've got to rehearse. Yeah, stop walking. Start rocking. I am not feel so much like rocking, he mumbles. He's got a look on his face I've never seen before. Artur, I say a little ticked off. We're wasting time. What's your problem? I am not have a problems. Until this I find in your pack back. Note to self. Next time you make a list of stupid pet names for Artur, destroy the evidence. I jam the list into my pocket. This is nothing, Artur, I tell him. It's a joke, that's all. Yes, so funny, he says. Except for nobody is laughing. He turns on his heel and walks off. Wait, Francis calls after him. What about enslave the mollusk? Get yourself another mollusk. I quit. Chapter 5 Nice move, Artur. Way to bail on us the day before our big debut. Yeah, maybe the list was a little snarky, but why does he have to be so sensitive? Let's see. Francis scans the piece of paper that just cost us our lead singer. I'd be sensitive, too, he says, if somebody called me a fart bucket. <laughs> but we all do that, I protest. The three of us call each other names all the time. Francis nods. I guess that's true, dipwad. You're both dipwads, Teddy says. You're standing around arguing instead of making music. 
Come on. He's right. We head back into the garage. I guess I should be researching my War of 1812 report. But why waste your brain cells on the Battle of Butt Swab when you can write a classic rock anthem called You're Never Alone in the Fitness Zone? Key of C! Wait, uh, which one is C again? We all agree that I'll do the singing. Francis and Teddy both have issues in that department. Francis issue. His voice has been declared a natural disaster. Ooh, follow your dream. Teddy issue. He's too spazzy to play and sing at the same time. How about we start with chopsticks? Hours later, we finally call it a night. Think we're ready? Francis asks. <laughs> oh, we're ready, I answer. Ready to blow the school's roof off? Tomorrow, the legend of Enslave the Mollusk begins. I never thought our big break would be singing about diet and exercise in the cafetorium. And I figured that when we got famous, our tour would be right there with us. I feel sort of bad about that. But I can't worry about it now. I've got to focus on tomorrow. Enslave the Mollusk rocks the house, 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 house. Hello, music fans. I'm Buzz Feedback. And I'm Max Volume coming to you live from the PS38 assembly. The principal is just finishing the morning announcements. We will be conducting a headlight screening during recess. The crowd's getting pumped up, Max. You said it, Buzz, and it's not about the headlight screening. And now, kids, let's hear it for Engage the Barnacle. Yay! He got their name wrong. What a nimrod. But it doesn't matter. Listen to them rock. Mmm, look at Francis's flying fingers. Feel the beat of Teddy's pounding piano. But it's Nate, who's the heart and soul of the band. Yes, Buzz, we've got a new rock idol on our hands. Nate! 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 He's so dreamy. Boys, I represent a major record label. I'm offering you a contract. Wow. What a performance by Enslave the Mollusk, Max. Right, Buzz. Next up, stardom. The end? Yeah, I know. There probably won't be any talent scouts roaming the hallways of PS38. But maybe something unexpected will happen. Nate? Are you still drawing comics? Go to sleep! Assemblies are always at the start of the day. So the next morning, we need to set up our gear first thing. We're on our way to the cafetorium when we walk right into the Marcus Show. Haha, <laughs> you're so right, Marcus. I think so, too. And so do I, Marcus. That's Marcus Good. He's a seventh grader, and he's way cool. I'm not sure why. Marcus Fact. He started wearing vintage hockey jerseys to school, and now everyone's doing it. But if Marcus gives you his seal of approval, it's like winning the lottery. At least that's what I've heard. He doesn't talk to sixth graders. Hey. You. Whoa. Does he mean us? I didn't think Marcus even knew we were alive. I hear you guys are playing at the assembly. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are, I tell him. He gives me an approving nod. That's cool, he says. Maybe for once the assembly won't be a total dweebathon. Francis laughs like a cat coughing up a hairball, but Marcus doesn't seem to notice. Go get him, dudes. Make it rock. Did you hear that? Teddy whispers excitedly. He dooted us! And he fist bumped me, I add. That's gold. We haven't even played yet, and the coolest kid in school's already an enslaved mollusk fan. Plus, it looks like my slump is officially over. I was already pretty sure about that. Now, with a thumbs up from Marcus, aka Joe Popular, I'm positive. Nate, I need to talk to you. Ah. Jenny. Maybe she wants to wish me good luck before the show. What's wrong with our tour? Or maybe not. 
He told me he quit the band, but he won't say why, she tells me. What happened? Wow. I guess our tour didn't tell Jenny about the list. My stomach tightens. I wish I never made that stinking thing. How am I supposed to explain why he quit without looking like a jerk? Will you ask him why he's so sad? He'll talk to you. He trusts you. Ouch. Hello, guilt trip. First stop, shame city. Finally, I mumble, Yeah, I, um... I can talk to him. That would be great. Thanks, Nate. Oh, and good luck with your song. Huh. She did end up wishing me luck. So how come I feel lower than a snake in a sewer pipe? Nate, move it! Let's do like Marcus said. Let's make it rock! Somehow I'm not quite as pumped for the assembly anymore. But the show must go on. As kids file into the cafetorium, we set up our gear. Principal Nichols steps to the mic. Is this on? <laughs> <clears throat> Students and teachers, PS38 has always been committed to good health, but now we're strengthening our efforts. Here now to tell you all about it in an original song is PS38's very own Enslave the Mollusk. Yay! At first, I'm just psyched that he actually got our name right. Then, as the applause erupts from the bleachers, my skin starts to tingle. The whole school, teachers, students, everybody is here. This is it. This is our big moment. Francis hits his opening chord, and Teddy plays the intro. Then they both turn to me. I open my mouth and... Uh... <clears throat> nothing. I mean, zip. What are you doing? Sing! I'm trying, but I can't. My mouth feels full of sawdust. My heart is pounding through my ribs. And my brain? totally missing in action. I can't remember the words. The crowd starts whispering, then mumbling, then laughing. Great. Hey, everyone, come to the assembly and watch Nate look like a dork. <laughs> Teddy, do something. Me? You do something. But my voice stinks. It's the only voice we've got. Hit it. Have you ever climbed some stairs and said, wow, that's exhausting? Have you ever spent the day just eating chocolate frosting? Do you ever watch TV until you're in a trance? Are you having difficulties fitting into your pants? Ooh, time to change your ways, and you don't have to do it alone. Ooh, hello, healthy days. Starting now, our school's a fitness zone. Francis sings a couple more verses about eating broccoli and getting exercise, but I barely hear them. I'm not even paying attention to my drumming. I'm just trying not to throw up. Well, <clears throat> that was interesting. Let's hear it for Enslave the Mollusk. There's a smattering of polite applause. And if you've ever been in a rock band, you know that polite applause is like kissing your sister. We slink off the stage and into the hallway. Why didn't you tell us you were going to have a brain cramp? Because I can't predict the future, genius! Heads up, boys. Assembly's over. The cafetorium doors swing open. An ocean of kids pours out. And look who's leading the pack. Marcus. He stops right in front of us, and so does everyone else. You can tell they're all waiting to hear what he says about the worst five minutes of our lives. I thought you clowns were gonna make music. Not comedy. Comedy! <laughs> Good one, Marcus. That makes it official. We're a joke. As we shuffle off to class... Francis and Teddy get their share of grief, but most of the teasing is aimed straight at me. After all, I'm the one who practically wet my pants up there. The day seems like it'll never end.
If I get asked even one more time where my mute button is, someone's gonna get a drumstick up their nose. Then the bell rings. Finally. Ladies and gentlemen, Enslave the Mollusk has left the building. Chapter 6 It's a week later, and everybody's still ragging on me about the assembly. <laughs> Look, it's T.T. Why so quiet, T.T.? Did you forget how to say hello? By the way, T.T. stands for tongue-tied. Hilarious, right? Don't listen to them, Nate, Dee Dee says over a lunch of, I'm not kidding, tofu burgers and three bean goulash. Plenty of people have blanked out on stage, even me. During my third grade production of Alice in Wonderland, I forgot all my lines. I just stood there saying nothing. Wow. Dee Dee saying nothing. What a concept. I know she's only trying to make me feel better, but it's not just my hall of shame moment at the assembly that's bugging me. It's what happened after that. Nate's Comics! Real-life catastrophes! After the assembly fiasco, I moped around all weekend. Welcome to Celebrity Shuffleboard! Nate? What Dad said. Don't leave your homework till the last minute. What I heard. Glorfnor Global Snick Frup Blup Plorst Monkey. Then on Monday morning... Disaster! Ring! Ugh. Time for social studies. Hand in your reports, people! Ah! But you said they weren't due until Wednesday! No, I said report cards come out on Wednesday. Your 1812 paper is due right now! Nope! I... I haven't finished it. What? She gave me 24 hours to finish. I fell asleep at my computer a couple of times, and I didn't have time to correct my mistakes. The Wab of 1812 Waf Ab Imprititin Terming History. Two days later. Look what came in the mail, kids. Your report cards. Yay! Uh-oh. Ellen, yours is outstanding. Naturally. And Nate, yours is... Help. Good gravy. A D in social studies? That's Parenting 101. Your kid brings home a pretty solid report card, except for social studies. It was all B's plus an A in art. But do you say anything about those grades? Nope. Why ruin a perfectly good meltdown with some praise? Do you find this acceptable? Dad was so mad, he didn't even punish me right away. He said he needed time to come up with an appropriate response. Translation? He wants to watch me squirm for a while. In the cafetorium, I asked Chad for his plastic bottle. You done with that bottle, Chad? Yup, it's all yours. Thunk, 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 thunk. I've never gotten a D before, so I'll bet Dad comes down pretty hard. But what'll he do? Pull me off the soccer team? Tell me I have to quit the doodlers? Make me eat egg salad every day for the rest of my... Hey, gang. Check this out. Looks like Marcus has started another trend. The hockey shirt is history. Now he's rocking a basketball jersey. And so are all his groupies. What's with the bottle, champ? He asks. And for the record, that champ didn't sound too friendly. This, oh, it, uh, it just sort of relaxes me, you know? Marcus rubs his chin. Makes sense, he says to all the suck-ups surrounding him. Don't you think so, guys? I sure do. Whatever you say, you're so right, Marcus. If you think so, I think so. You're the man, Marcus. Yeah, Marcus continues. It totally makes sense, because every baby needs a bottle. <laughs> yeah, Marcus! <laughs> Baby! My cheeks burn as Marcus and the Marquette stroll off, their laughter echoing in my ears. What a jerk, Dee Dee mutters as we get up from the table. Why is he picking on you? Why wouldn't he? 
It's so easy. It feels like I've got a target on my back lately. Uh, I don't know about the target on your back, Dee Dee tells me. But you've definitely got gum on your butt. Great. I've got a tail. Oh, there's enough gum here to stretch all the way to Alaska, which is where I wish I were right now. Anywhere but here. What happened to that table? I think that kid with goofy hair sat in some gum. Sat in what? Gum! What a loser! <laughs> we scoot out of the cafetorium as fast as we can and run right into Francis and Teddy. What's so funny? Did Chester blow yogurt out his nose again? Nothing, I grumble. Just another train wreck. Uh, speaking of trains, Francis says, you've got gum on your caboose. Thanks, doofus. I didn't realize that. Nate, I want you to have this. You need it way more than I do. Chad fishes something out of his pocket and hands it to me. It's the little plastic foot Chad found last week. Your good luck charm? Chad nods. Your luck's in the toilet, right? I roll my eyes. You could say that. Then take it, he tells me. It's been working great for me. It might do the same for you. Thanks, Chad. Yeah, I remember what I said last week, that this probably isn't a real good luck charm. But the way things are going, I might as well try it. Let's go, dudes. We've got Jim. Jim? Uh, oh, no. We all like Jim, but only when Coach Calhoun is in charge. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, Coach John takes over. And today's Thursday. Get a move on, scrubs! Double time! Hup, hup, hup! We all hustle into the locker room. As I wait for the guys to finish changing, I tuck Chad's foot into my sock. Hey, why not? What have I got to lose? Coach John blasts on his whistle. Attention, troops, he bellows. Line up for jazzercise. Ugh. Jazzercise, a.k.a. spazzercise, stinks. We just stand in one spot for half an hour doing cheese ball dance moves. It looks like a group audition for the world's worst music video. Dance, baby, dance. Shake, shake, shake your pants. Why can't we play basketball? Someone asks. Because I say so. Yeah, and also because if we play basketball, he's got to drag his double wide onto the floor and ref the game. For jazzercise, he can crank up his boombox and spend the class doing crossword puzzles. Anybody got a five-letter word for lazy? It ticks me off. Why does Coach John always get to decide what we do? Can't someone else decide? Can't someone protest? Someone like him. Me. We don't want to do jazzercise. We want to play basketball. Coach John's eyes narrow into slits. What was that? He growls. There's no turning back now. I swallow hard. The school's a fitness zone, right? And basketball's a way better workout than jazzercise. So if you want to get us in good shape, you should let us play basketball. Yeah, jazzercise is boring. We want basketball. At first, Coach John doesn't say anything. Maybe he's stunned that a student stood up to him. Or maybe he's stealth farting. It's hard to tell. Finally, he grabs a basketball from the rack. Well, that sounds fair, he says in his fakiest fake voice. I'll be happy to let you play basketball if you'll do something for me. Um, okay, I answer cautiously. Like what? Nothing too difficult, he smirks. All you have to do is make a basket. Just one basket. From midcourt. Backwards, with your eyes closed. That sounds fair, don't you think? He asks. Sure, fair for him. This is a sucker bet. Coach John knows he can't lose. Now, if you miss it, you'll be jazzercising for a month, he continues, steering me to the center of the floor. 
but I'm sure you can make it with a little luck. Luck. Great. I've had so much of that lately. A shot from mid-court is exactly 41 feet 9 inches. Shh. My palms are sweatier than Coach John's armpits. I glance over at the other kids and notice Chad giving me a thumbs up. I remember his little plastic foot. If that thing does have any luck in it, now's the time to find out. I take one last look at the basket, turn around, close my eyes, and take my best shot. Chapter 7 Shoot! The ball flies right through the hoop like it's remote controlled. It doesn't even graze the rim. It barely touches the net. The whole gym goes completely bananas, except for two people. Coach John, and Dee Dee. No, no, Jazzercise is my life. Talk about a miracle. For half a second, I think about sticking it right in Coach John's face. Well, looks like we're playing basketball after all. Oh, you okay, Coach? You look a bit stressed. But I don't. I'm not insane. Plus, I remember one of Chad's grandmother's goofy sayings. Don't poke the bear. He might eat you. Or he might make you do squat thrusts until you hurl. Do I really want to taste that three-bean goulash a second time? Short answer. Starts with N, rhymes with go. So I act like sinking a backwards half-court shot with my eyes closed is no biggie. And we spend the next hour, sorry, Dee Dee, actually having fun. Later on the way to math, Chad nudges me. Told you my good luck charm worked. What good luck charm? I show the foot to the guys. Francis frowns. We all know that look. Here comes one of his smarty McKnow-it-all comments. There's absolutely no proof that so-called good luck charms have any effect on real-life events, he announces. No proof? What about that shot Nate made? That was incredibly lucky. Ahem. <clears throat> and incredibly skillful. He might have made that shot without the plastic foot, Francis points out. For me to believe it's really a good luck charm, I'll need to see more evidence. I'll show you some in math. Sounds like a reason to stay awake for a change. We cruise into the math room and take our seats. Mr. Staples waves his arm for quiet, then... Knock, knock. Who's there? Pop. Pop who? Pop quiz. Clear your desks. Wait, what? We just had a pop quiz last Thursday. Isn't this illegal? Or unconstitutional? Or something? Psst. Looks like your good luck charm is broken. Too bad Francis is out of noogie range. But he could be right. Maybe Chad's foot is just... a foot. You have 30 minutes to complete the quiz, Mr. Staples tells us. You may begin... now. Huh? Something screwy here. Where did these math problems come from, Pluto? Other kids seem confused, too. Even Gina looks clueless. Um, Mr. Staples? Yes, Gina? We've never done equations like this. Really? Mr. Staples says in surprise. He turns to the nearest desk. Mark, may I look at your quiz? Oh, for heaven's sake, what a moron. I, I don't mean you, Mark, he adds quickly. Fact check. Mark actually is a moron. He's also got a serious earwax issue. I photocopied the wrong quiz. Oh, I need to zip to the teacher's lounge. Be right back. As he shuts the door behind him, the classroom starts buzzing. Total TSU. Just so you know, TSUs are teacher screw-ups, and they happen more than you think. After all, teachers are human. Sort of. Whenever a teacher pulls a TSU, we kids are all over it. But only one of us is genius enough to write them down. Meow, meow. 
Time for the official PS38 TSU Cavalcade! Principal Nichols. He doesn't often realize the intercom is on before he starts reading the morning announcements. Mm. Oh, this jelly donut is fantastic! Ms. Clark. Last month she had an incident in the faculty parking lot. She hit another teacher. Ow! My bad. Mr. Galvin. He misplaced his glasses just before giving us an anatomy lecture, using the fire procedures chart. And this, of course, is the large intestine. Mr. Rosa. He was using the new kiln for the first time, and he blew up everyone's sculptures. My walrus! My zebra! On the bright side, this leads right into our mosaic project. Ms. Brindle. She gave herself food poisoning while showing us how to make crab rangoon. Does anyone else feel a bit queasy? Um, you're turning green. Mrs. Godfrey. She never admits she's wrong, which is the biggest TSU of all. But you told us to read Chapter 5, not Chapter 6. No, I did not. Yes, you did. You're wrong. But silence! The door swings open. Mr. Staples is back, looking a little flustered. Well, he says, so much for that idea. The copy machine's broken. I'm postponing the quiz till next week. Yay! So, math is a breeze. And there's more good news in science. Mr. Galvin isn't even there. He felt ill, so he went home. You have a free period. After school, I practically float out of the building. No math quiz and no Galvin, I crow to Francis. What do you think of Chad's foot now? I'm still not convinced, he sniffs. Yeah, those were lucky breaks, but they were lucky for everyone. A real good luck charm shouldn't work for the whole class. It should work for its owner. That's you. Well... What am I supposed to do, go sit in a cave and hope I get lucky? Hey, what's this? Is it yours, Dee Dee? Mine? No, I don't have any jewelry that fancy. Oh, <gasps> my necklace! I have no idea who this lady is, but she's sure happy to see me. You wonderful boy, she gushes. Where on earth did you find it? Right here in the grass, I tell her, handing it over. She beams at me. Bless your heart, young man. This necklace is irreplaceable. My husband gave it to me fifty years ago. How romantic, Dee Dee sighs. The woman looks so happy I can't help but feel kind of good that I found her necklace. And then, seconds later, I feel even better. A good deed like this calls for a reward. May I give you twenty dollars? And I won't take no for an answer, she tells me. Obviously, she has no idea that saying no to 20 bucks never even crossed my mind. Wow, I stammer. Thank you. No, thank you. You've made this my lucky day. Ahem. Speaking of luck, okay, okay. The foot works. Francis chuckles. <laughs> I can't argue with twenty dollars. Me neither. Come on, you guys, I say, waving the bill over my head. I'll buy us a snack at the Sugar Bowl. A real snack or a fitness zone snack? Soybean ice cream for everybody! With spinach sauce and broccoli sprinkles. We trade stupid tofu jokes until Dee Dee changes the subject. So, Chad, is it true you've got a mega crush on Maya? As usual, she's as subtle as a sledgehammer. Chad doesn't answer. He doesn't have to. His cheeks have gone code red. I think you should ask her out, Dee Dee continues. You two would make a cute couple. Pump the brakes, Cupid, Teddy says. He'll ask her when he's good and ready. Right, Chad? Chad? Chapter 8 Chad's not moving. 
He's frozen in place like a red-headed lawn gnome. Then we see why. Marcus and his traveling roadshow are playing hacky sack across the street. All the kids over there are seventh graders, except one. Maya? She and Marcus seem sort of, uh, friendly. Wait a minute. I thought Maya liked you. So did I, Chad mumbles. He looks lower than an ant's ankles. Maya and Marcus? Oh, the sorrow, the heartbreak. Chillax, Dee Dee. No need to go into drama queen overdrive. This is Chad's tragedy, not yours. Besides, I know exactly why Maya's cozying up to Marcus. He's a seventh grader. See, girls grow up faster than guys. We learned that from Coach John in Health and Hygiene. The lesson that day was our changing bodies. Awkward. Okay, slugs, let's talk about a special time in your lives called puberty. Ugh, anyway, we found out that your average sixth grade girl is like the age of a seventh grade boy maturity-wise, which means that all of us sixth grade guys are at the very bottom of the middle school love chain. Eighth grade boys. Shall we take in a movie, my dear? Seventh grade girls. Ah, oh, you betcha. Seventh grade boys. Allow me to sweep you off your feet. Sixth grade girls. Go for it, tiger. Sixth grade boys. Your breath smells like cat poop. Dog. <laughs> it doesn't always happen like that. Exhibit A, Jenny and Artur. But it's pretty common. Nobody's shocked when a sixth grade girl likes a seventh grade boy. Except Chad. I'm not hungry anymore. I'm gonna skip the sugar bowl. Chad, wait! I call out. I'll buy you a gut buster. Sugar bowl fact. Nobody ever finished a gut buster in one sitting. Not even Mark Cheswick. Nope! He's gonna hurl! Everybody stand back! No thanks, he answers. I forgot that. Uh... I told my mom I'd come straight home after school. Oop! Uh-oh. Uh-oh what? Sorry, guys, I gotta go. I owe you a snack. I peel out from my house at warp speed. With all the good luck vibes flying around when school ended, I totally forgot about what Dad said when I left the house this morning. Come straight home after school. We'll talk about your report card. You know what's worse than having an appointment to get chewed out? Being late for it. <gasps> I'm... Uh, I'm home. Ah, good. I thought maybe you'd forgotten. Forgotten? Me? No. <laughs> I was studying. Yeah, um, studying with some other highly motivated students like myself and sit down. I want to read something to you. Hmm. Don't know where he's going with this, but at least he's not pitching a fit. And as long as read-along time doesn't involve one of Ellen's cheeseball novels about vampire supermodels, I'm there. <clears throat> In all my years of teaching, I've never encountered such an undisciplined student. He is inattentive and often disruptive during class, and he seems more concerned with making jokes than doing his schoolwork. Nice. Old dragon breath's got a real way with words, I grumble. Actually, old drag, uh, uh, Mrs. Godfrey didn't write this. It was written by Mrs. Brody. Who? There's no Mrs. Brody at PS 38. There used to be. This is my sixth grade report card. My jaw drops into my lap. What? He smiles. Tough to imagine me as a sixth grader? Tough. Try impossible. I can't even imagine him with hair. Nate, Dad says. I have a confession to make. I, uh, wasn't exactly an honor roll student. Really? Wow. Maybe we should have these father-son talks more often. It's not that I didn't try, he adds quickly. It was just that sometimes... Well... Sometimes... Stuff happened? Right. 
And I understand that stuff sometimes happens in your life, too. I roll my eyes. You can say that again. So, uh, are you grounding me, or... No, I'm not. But, rats, I knew there was a but coming. I'm also not telling you it's okay to get a D in social studies, he says, switching back to bad cop mode. Clearly, you need to spend a lot more time on your homework. So, until further notice, no drawing comics in your notebook at bedtime. And that's final. No arguing. Okay, champ? Okay. Hey, what's there to argue about? Considering how bad Dad could have slammed me, I got off pretty easy. At least, that's my first reaction. But a few hours later, after supper, anyone for Meatloaf Jubilee, homework, I officially hate whoever invented fractions, and a shower, thanks for using all the hot water, Ellen. I'm starting to realize this will be harder than I thought. I mean, cartooning is my life. I draw before bed every night. Without drawing, I can't even sleep. How am I gonna... Oop. As I toss my pants into the closet, Chad's lucky foot slips out of the pocket. Whoa. Suddenly, my brain starts connecting the dots. Foot. Feet. Sneakers. Dad said I couldn't draw in my notebook. He never said I couldn't draw on other stuff. Like footwear, for example. Turns out, a ballpoint pen works great on canvas sneakers. Except an hour later, my size sixes aren't just sneakers anymore. They're Nate Wright Originals! The next day at school, it's Dee Dee, she's sort of a fashion geek, who notices them first. Oh, Nate! Your shoes are fabulous! And since Dee Dee's voice is louder than a jackhammer on steroids, it's not long before other kids start crowding around. Wow, Nate, those are sweet! How long did that take? Can you decorate my shoes? Psst, look who's coming. What's going on? A girl named Shauna speaks up. Marcus, look at Nate's shoes. Marcus saunters over. He glances down at my feet and snorts. <laughs> Big wow. He took a pair of cheap sneakers and drew pictures on them. Your sneakers cost what? Twenty bucks? Mine cost ten times that much. They're the kind the pros wear. There's some mumbling as all eyes turn from my feet to his. Then Shauna says quietly, Yeah, but Nate's are awesome. Yeah, they rock. I want sneaks like that. Head start nodding. More kids push past Marcus to look at my sneakers up close. He shrugs uncertainly, then looks around for his posse. Pfft, whatever. Come on, you guys. He shuffles away but the group of kids that follows him isn't as big as it usually is. Teddy stares at me wide-eyed after they're gone. Dude, do you know what this means? You're cooler than Marcus! Chapter 9 The Great Sneaker Scribble is on. By lunchtime, half the kids in school have customized their sneakers just like yours truly. Check it out. I naded my high tops. I naded mine, too. I'm nading mine right now. Did you hear that? Francis says as we sit down. You've become a verb. Ha! Ah. Personally, I think you're more like an adjective, Teddy cracks. You know, descriptive words. Short, ugly, goofy, dim-witted, clonk. Ow. He glares at me as he rubs his head. I thought you said getting hit with a bottle feels good. It does, Einstein, I tell him. But it helps if the bottle's empty. I'll pour it into a cup. There. Now it's ready. Thunk, 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 thunk. Hey, that does feel relaxing. Told ya. Nate, can I... can we borrow that? I don't know their names, but I recognize these kids. They're seventh graders and they're both part of Marcus's posse of wannabes. Sure, I say. I hand over the bottle. Thunk, 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 thunk. 
<laughs> this is awesome. Hey, my turn. Jeremy, Monica, what are you doing? Just, uh, trying out Nate's bottle, Marcus. The kid named Jeremy stammers. Well, you look like a moron, Marcus sneers. Knock it off. But what if I don't want to knock it off? I mean, it's fun. And it makes a nice sound. Marcus looks disgusted. Fine. You want to copy some snot-nosed sixth grader? Be my guest. Come on, Maya. As Marcus stalks off, Dee Dee sails in. Can I join the party? She asks. Or do I need a reservation to sit with Joe Cool? What's that supposed to mean? I say. She rolls her eyes. Oh, boys are so dense. She sighs. Look around you! All around us, kids were hitting their heads with plastic bottles. Thunk, 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 thunk. They're imitating you. You're a trendsetter. Yeah, but it's not like I'm trying to set trends. It's just, well, everything is... It's... It's the good luck foot. Nate can do no wrong. Bingo. I haven't said much about the foot because I don't want to jinx it. But look at everything that's happened since Chad gave it to me. I sank that miracle shot in gym. Some lady gave me 20 bucks. Dad didn't ground me. And now, kids I don't even know are asking, will you sign our sneakers? Bottom line, this is the most epic good luck streak of my life. Maybe of anyone's life. And it just keeps on rolling. I'm officially in the zone. Thursday. Dad cancels my no drawing before bed punishment, which is why I'm drawing right now. Have I told you lately what an amazing son you are? I already knew that. Friday. Mr. Rosa puts my sneakers in the display case. They smell like dead fish, but they're artistic masterpieces. Ooh. Saturday, Sunday. We win back-to-back -back shutouts against Hurley and Coolidge. What a save! This kid's a superstar! And he's cute, too. Monday, at the supermarket. You're our one millionth customer! You won a year supply of cheese doodles! Wahoo! Tuesday, multiple choice test. I can't answer any of these. I'll just close my eyes and guess. Poink, poink, poink. Poink. You got all of them right. The lucky foot strikes again. So, what are you going to do today? Teddy asks as we walk to school the next morning. Win the lottery? Get elected president? Inherit a four-leaf clover farm? Wow. Got sarcasm? He's probably sick of me playing Lucky the Leprechaun 24-7. I can't blame him. I used to feel the same way about... Someone else. Yep, our tour. So much stuff has gone right for me lately, I'd almost forgotten about our little, uh, incident. Almost. Hey, our tour, wait up. Can I talk to you for a second? There's a pause. Okay, he says finally. Then, silence. Suddenly, my vocal cords are having a spaz attack. I know what I want to say, so why can't I spit it out? I stuff my hands in my pockets and feel Chad's plastic foot. Come on, foot. Help me do this. Listen, Artur, I just wanted to say, uh, to tell you that, um, that I'm sorry about, you know, about that stupid list of names I wrote. I have no idea why I did it, I tell him. Well, maybe I sort of do, but I... Nate, our tour holds up his hand. You do not have to explaining. I am understand why you did it. Sometimes you are too wishing you are me. Ouch. Hey, thanks for the honesty, our tour. How about a little less of it next time? Yes, I know these feelings, he continues. Because sometimes I wish I am you. Okay, now that's a surprise. Uh, you do? I ask, trying to sound casual. How come? 
Now it's Artur's turn to look surprised. Is it not so total obvious, Nate? He says. Your life is such interesting. Wow. I'll admit I've always thought my life rocked, but I never knew Artur did. He chuckles. <laughs> you are always getting in the middle of so crazy happenings. I groan. Ugh, yeah, like at the assembly. That was a disaster. No, you guys did okay. But we sound better with you. Artur, um, how about rejoining the band? He breaks into a huge smile. I think that's a yes. Come on, I say. Let's go tell Francis and Teddy that enslaved mollusk will rock again. Whoa, slow down, gents. Save the running for field day. What's field day? I ask. Just another part of our fitness zone program, Coach explains. The whole school's going to take part in a friendly athletic competition. We'll have races and contests of all kinds. It'll be tons of fun. Oh, -ho! so much like the Olympics. Exactly. Ooh, will jazzercise be included? It's not a dance-off, Twinkle Toes, I tell her. It's sports. It's a contest. Well, I happen to like activities that aren't all intense, she sniffs. There are no winners or losers in jazzercise. You're half right, I crack. Dee Dee has a point, Nate, Coach says. Field day isn't about winning and losing. It's about fitness and good health. <laughs> See, he agreed with me, Dee Dee says as Coach walks off. It doesn't matter who comes in first. It does to me. I like winning. Ha! <laughs> then you're in for quite the letdown. Uh-oh. Here comes trouble. The seventh grade is going to demolish the sixth grade on field day, Marcus crows. Yes, I am agree, Artur says matter-of-factly, because you're a whole year more older. Marcus smirks. No, because sixth graders are totally lame. And seventh graders are totally obnoxious. In fact, I'm willing to bet that the sixth grade won't win a single event on field day. Oh, yeah? I'll take that bet. Why are you betting? Dee Dee chirps. Coach said it's not about who wins, it's about fitness. He was right, Marcus says with a snort. You sixth graders could use a little fitness, especially him. Hey, Super Chunk, come over here, Marcus calls to Chad. Chad edges slowly toward us. M me? He asks. Do you see any other Super Chunks around here? Because I don't. Chad's cheeks turn pink. That's not my name. My name's Chad. Marcus isn't impressed. Okay, Chad. What's your field day event? <laughs> the hundred meter waddle? You leave him alone, Dee Dee growls. Marcus holds up his hands in mock innocence. Hey, I'm just having a friendly conversation with Chad here. And besides, who's gonna stop me? I am. Chapter 10 Marcus looks stunned. We all do. Nobody's ever heard Maya raise her voice. But hey, there's a first time for everything. Why are you picking on Chad? What's he ever done to you? Okay, okay, Marcus mumbles. You don't have to throw a fit about it. He isn't worth the trouble. Now let's go. Maya jerks her hand away. Why would you want me tagging along? She says angrily. I'm a sixth grader, and sixth graders are totally lame. Remember? Not you, Marcus tells her. He waves a hand at the rest of us. I was talking about these losers. They're not lame, and they're not losers, Maya says, her voice shaking. They're my friends. Marcus nods. Isn't that sweet? You can all be pathetic together. What a slime ball, I mutter. Maya looks like she might start bawling. Then, Chad, I'm... I'm... 
and Maya runs away, crying. Okay, it's official, I say. I don't understand girls. Dee Dee rolls her eyes. On behalf of girls everywhere, thanks for the news flash. I'm talking about Maya. Why'd she run off? Dee Dee gives me one of her you're as dumb as a sock puppet head shakes. Why do you think? Um, because she just had an epic blowout with her boyfriend? <laughs> He's not her boyfriend, Sherlock. Well, what would you call him? She obviously likes the guy. Maya doesn't like Marcus, Dee Dee declares, almost poking my eye out as she waves her finger. She likes Chad. She does? Then why have she and Marcus been super glued together for the past week, I ask. Well, imagine you're a sixth grade girl. Me? <laughs> Yikes. What I meant was, put yourself in my shoes, Dee Dee explains. She's shy, she's quiet. When Mr. Seventh Grade Big Shot started paying attention to her, she was probably flattered. But now she's seen Marcus being a jerk. She's embarrassed, she's mortified. How you can be sure? Dee Dee strikes a pose. Ahem, she says. We women just know these things. Oh, brother. Chad, why don't you go talk to Maya? He blushes. But what would I say? Here, read this. I'll tell you everything you need to know. Nate Wright Comics presents Dan Cupid, a love consultant with... Romance tips. Attention all boys. Do you ever have trouble talking to girls? Blork, erk, blonk. What? You can improve your chances of finding love by avoiding these mistakes. Mistake number one. Using cheesy pickup lines. Hi. Do you have an oxygen tank? Because you take my breath away. Mistake number two, when compliments go wrong. I like your hair. Thank you. It's so thick. Well, I like a mop. A mop? Mistake number three, misuse of poetry. When I see you, my heart is aching. You smell good, like a plate of bacon. Say what? Mistake number four. Coming on too strong. Hey, sweet cake. Can you feel the electricity between us? Zap! Mistake number five. Coming on too weak. Excuse me, I... Oops. I just wedged myself. Mistake number six. Hygiene issues. Hi there. Ew! You have food stuck in your braces. See? These tactics will get you a one-way ticket back to Singlesville. This is Dan Cupid, love consultant, signing off. Chad hands the comic back to me. I don't think this will do me much good, he sighs. It only tells me what not to do. Just do whatever you did last time, I tell him. The two of you had a long talk in the cafetorium, didn't you? Yeah, Chad says. But that was... before. Before what? Dee Dee asks. But Chad doesn't have time to say anything. I have already pulled the answer out of my pocket. Before he gave me the foot. Here, Chad, it's all yours. Really? It worked for me when I needed some good luck. Maybe it'll do the same for you. I hope you're right, Chad says quietly. Thanks, Nate. You're a real friend. <laughs> Don't mind me. Dee Dee sniffs, wiping glop off her nose. I just get emotional sometimes. I try to keep a straight face. You? No way. The bell interrupts Dee Dee's drama-rama. Better stick a cork in it, I tell her. We've got homeroom. Nate, I have a question for you. Since you give away lucky foot to Chad, what if your life now turns to disaster? I'm hoping that won't happen, I answer. Maybe my good luck will last a while. Nate? Or maybe not. 
Someone must have crawled out from under the wrong side of the rock this morning. Before the bell rang, young man, Mrs. Godfrey hisses at me through clenched teeth. I did a desk inspection. Uh-oh. That means she's not just trolling for desktop graffiti. She's sticking her big fat nose inside our desks, too. Which, in case you were wondering, is bad news for me. Explain this, Mrs. Godfrey says, handing me a drawing. Ultronate and Mega Chad versus Mrs. Godzilla. Look out, she's got a textbook. And prehistoric body odor. Explain it? Okay. It's a work of cartooning genius. Need I say more? Ultra-Nate and Mega-Chad, she reads aloud at about one syllable per second. Obviously, this drawing was a team effort. Chad, come here, please. Yep. Poor Chad looks like a minnow in a shark tank. Wait, I protest. Chad didn't have anything to do with this. Mrs. Godfrey stares me down. I'll determine that for myself, if you don't mind. Well, Chad, did you collaborate with Nate on this drawing? N no, ma'am, Chad squeaks. Her eyes narrow. What's that in your hand? This? Um, it looks like part of a toy, she says. And toys are not permitted in this classroom. Hand it over. Mrs. Godfrey drops the foot into her desk drawer. Then she gets back to business. Chad, you may return to your seat. And Nate, you may report to detention after school. Gee, that went well. I flop down into my chair and sneak a glance over at Chad. He's staring miserably into space. I know how he feels. Looks like the good luck streak is officially over. For both of us. Chapter 11 I spend the next four days praying for rain, but it's no use. On the morning of field day, there's not a cloud in the sky. It's perfect humiliation weather. Mate, we just saw you talking to Marcus, Francis says. How come? I grimace. We were finalizing our bet. But you made that bet when you still had the lucky foot. Why didn't you call it off? I shake my head. I can't back out. That would make me a bigger weasel than he is. Like that's possible, Teddy grumbles. All I can do is hope that somehow the sixth grade can find a way to win one event. It could happen, Francis says, not very convincingly. Yeah, and Coach John could take up belly dancing. Ha! <laughs> Attention, everyone! Welcome to PS 38's Fitness Zone Field Day! Captains, assemble your teams. Captains? I say in surprise. Who's our captain? Teddy shrugs. Beats me. I am... Gina! Somebody needed to take charge. She smirks as she tapes a sheet of paper to the flagpole. I've taken the liberty of creating an official event schedule. Check this list for your assignment, everyone. What? Is this a joke? What's the problem, pinhead? Mark Cheswick running the 100-meter dash, I say. Anne Maria Brutzi throwing the shot put? Gina folds her arms. Yes. So? I look around and lower my voice. They'll get destroyed, I hiss. At least put people in events they could actually win. The whole point of field day is fitness, dork face, she snarls. I'm not trying to win. Well, that's obvious. You've got Mason doing the high jump. Me? Is something wrong, Nate? Uh, oh, huh. No, coach. Good, because being a part of a team means respecting your captain. Even when she's Captain Clueless? Gina grins in triumph and flounces off. My event's not till later. For now, there's nothing to do except watch my team get crushed. Nate's All Too Real Life Comics presents Field Day Follies! One Mile Run! 
It six laps around the school. Unfortunately, Todd Dunphy only made it three and a half. <gasps> Winner, seventh grade. Long jump. Dee Dee didn't realize there are no style points in long jumping. Ta-da! Winner, seventh grade. One hundred meter dash. Mark Cheswick lost to two sixth graders, three seventh graders, and a butterfly. Eat my dust, chump. Winner, seventh grade. Softball throw. Nina McFadden has a pretty good arm, but her sense of direction blows. She hit Principal McFadden. You're supposed to throw it away from the teachers. Oopsie. Winner, seventh grade. Relay race. Teddy passed the baton to Randy, who passed it to Francis, who tried to pass it to Mary Ellen Popowski. Take it! Take it! Ew, boy cooties. Winner, seventh grade. Want to hear the sad part? Those were some of our better events. Obviously, if I want to win this bet with Marcus, it's all up to me. Nate, get moving. It's time for your race. Coach's voice echoes across the field. The next event is the 60-meter hurdles. Competing for the 6th grade, Nate Wright. And for the 7th grade, Kareem Trillin. Yikes. That kid's legs come up to my neck. He looks like he can step over the hurdles. Then I probably don't have much of a chance. But anything could happen. On your mark, get set, go! And then... Something does happen. Kareem trips. As he scrambles to his feet, I'm already clearing the first hurdle. I'm really moving now. Four hurdles to go. I peek to my left. Kareem's gaining fast, but he's gonna run out of room. Three hurdles to go. Two. One hurdle to go. Clip. Wham! It's like one of those slow-motion nightmares. I trip over the last hurdle. As the blood rushes through my head and I try to get back up, I hear Kareem's footsteps pound by me. I win! And here comes the welcoming committee. Hey, it's Nate Wrong. Let me ask you something, Speedy. Since you're such a trendsetter, do you think falling on your face will become a new fad? <laughs> Dee Dee zips over and starts brushing the dirt and grass off me. No snappy comeback, she asks. What's there to say, I mutter. He won the bet. Not yet. There's still one event left. Yeah, which we have zero chance of winning. Dee Dee frowns. You look miserable, she tells me. I don't know who's feeling worse, you or Chad. Poor guy, I say. So he still hasn't talked to Maya? Dee Dee shakes her head. He says he can't do it without his lucky foot. It's so tragic. They'd make such a great team. Her words hit me right in the face. Team, I shout. Dee Dee, I just thought of something. Where are you going? She calls as I go sprinting away. But there's no time to explain. I have to find... Aha! Artur, I want to talk to you about... Wondering what I'm up to? Sorry, it's top secret. And if I do say so myself, it's brilliant. I just hope it works. Attention, please. The final event of the day is the three-legged race. For the seventh grade, the contestants are Marcus and Jacob. And the sixth grade team is Maya and Artur. Artur leans into me. Now? He whispers. I nod. Now. Excuse, please. Artur hops over to coach like a frog with arthritis. I cannot do racing because I am hurt my ankle. Wait, what? Artur, you should have reported this injury to me the minute it happened, Gina huffs. As captain, it's my job to find an appropriate substitute to take your place in the- What's that, Gina? You think Chad should race with Maya? Hmm. Me? Great idea. Wish I'd thought of it. What? Sputter! Fine, Coach says. It'll be Maya and Chad, then. Nate, help them get ready, please. Cuddle up close, you two. I've got to tie your legs together. Hi. Hi. Chad's cheeks are as red as a Christmas stocking. I've, um, never been in a three-legged race, he says to Maya. 
I'll probably be terrible. She smiles shyly. I think you'll be great. You'll both be great, as long as you don't try to run too fast. Speed isn't everything. Marcus interrupts me. Hey, Dweebus Maximus, this is your last chance to win our bet. <laughs> Are you sure you want to put your faith in those losers? I give him an icy stare. Yep. I picked the fastest runner in the whole school for my partner, he crows. What a great strategy, I say. For just an instant, his grin falters. Then, Coach whistles sharply. All right, teams, line up. On your mark, let's start with our inside feet. Okay. Get set. Which foot do we shut up, stupid? Just run. Go! Maya and Chad burst off the line and gradually pick up speed. The seventh graders? Not so much. What are you doing? You're going too fast. No, you're going too slow. Look at Marcus and Jacob, Francis exclaims. They're all herky-jerky. Teddy chuckles. <laughs> the key word being jerky. Maya and Chad look fabulous, Dee Dee chirps. This is fascinating. Francis says in his nerdiest, nutty professor voice. Individually, they're much slower than the seventh graders, but together, their superior teamwork makes them faster. What do you think of Marcus and Jacob's teamwork? Teddy cracks. Stop pulling! Ow! Hey! You moron, cut it out! Well, it's... different. We have expression for this in my country, Artur says. He's called hot mess. The race is over way before Maya and Chad cruise across the finish line. That was more than a win. It was a good old-fashioned butt-kicking. I turn to Dee Dee. You were right about those two, I say. They do make a great team. Chapter 12 Okay, guys, I say. When Principal Nichols introduces us, we'll play You're Never Alone in the Fitness Zone. Again? Right, because it went so well last time. Only the melody is the same, you idiots, I tell them. The words are different. Right, Artur? Yes, absoluteness. From behind the curtain, we can hear the cafetorium filling up. It's our weekly assembly, and we've got another chance to rock. I want to know more about your bet with Marcus, Francis says. What if you'd lost? It would have been a nightmare, I answer. I was going to become a mini Marcus. I promised to dress like him, act like him, and follow him around for a whole week. Ah! But you won, Teddy says. So what does Marcus have to do for you? Just then, Principal Nichols' voice came blasting over the intercom. Let's all give a warm PS38 welcome to Enslave the Mollusk. You're about to find out, I say as the curtain rises. Hit it, Artur. A race was run just yesterday. Three-legged was its name. The sixth grade team claimed victory. The seventh grade was lame. Grade six ran fast with graceful strides, a wonder to behold. Grade seven ran like my Aunt Marge, who's eighty-six years old. They simply couldn't understand the teamwork mother most. And that is why at races and the seventh grade was toast. Ooh, they were stressed to the max, cause losing to your rival isn't fun. Ooh, they should try to relax. Now watch while Chad shows Marcus how it's done. And Chad beats a tune on Marcus's head with a plastic bottle. Thunk, 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 thunk. Hmm, that's odd. Francis chuckles as Chad continues with his, uh, drum solo. Marcus doesn't look relaxed, but Chad does. Artur smiles. I am feel happy for Chad. He won the race and also got together with Maya. And he did it all without his good luck foot, Francis points out. 
Ah, oh, we'll never see that foot again. Teddy sighs. Once something disappears in the black hole of Mrs. Godfrey's desk, it's gone forever. But we're doing okay without it, I remind him. Besides, why do we need a foot when the whole school is giving us a hand? The End <laughs>